Okay, today is our great pleasure to have Professor Ignacio Sirac from Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. Ignacio got his PhD from Complutense University of Madrid in 1991. And right after that, he became associate professor at the University of Castilla-La Mancha from 1991 to 1996. And after that, he joined the University of Innsbruck as a full professor and stayed there between 1996 and 2001. Since 2001, he became the director of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. And in the year of uh, 2002, he became an uh, honorable professor at Technical University of Munich. Ignacio has done many uh, great pioneering works. For example, he introduced the proposal of using code atoms to do quantum simulation and quantum computing. He also developed a theory of tensor network and made pioneering contributions to quantum algorithm, quantum communication, and quantum information theory. He has won many awards over the years. And here I just list a few. He was awarded the Benjamin Franklin Medal in 2010 and the World Prize in Physics in 2013, and also no, uh, Niels Bohr Medal in 2013. And more recently, he got the Bell Prize in Physics and the Mises Quantum Prize in 2019. There are more awards that I cannot list them out here. I recommend you to look at his website, get a full story. And today he's going to tell us about preparation of tensor network states. Ignacio, it's all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And, uh, and so, first of all, also thanks to the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to give this video conference. I'm sorry about the time, so I know that that's not, at least not the usual time which you have these seminars, and but here in Europe and it's a bit late, and so the typical time would have been a bit a bit late for me. So I'm going to talk about um, something that uh, typically doesn't go together. So I mean, there are people like we in our group who work on quantum algorithms for quantum simulations. So how we can describe many body quantum systems with quantum computers and learn. Uh, them now using analog or, or digital quantum computers, and then we have there are also people working on the competing the competing uh, 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 method, which is tensor networks. These are classical methods to describe this many body system with classical computers, and so both of them work relatively well in some uh, regimes and so on. But what I want to talk about here is putting them together. So I want to show you how one can prepare these tensor network states now with quantum computers. And what will be important is I want to do it efficient. So, so here's a, a typical scenario uh, that you have a many body systems, which is in a lattice, for example, in two dimensions, a square lattice in two dimensions with qubits or spins in the, in the, in the vertices, it could be in the edges or whatever. And then you have a many body state and this many body state is described in terms of a tensor network. And uh, so you have a tensor, which is, I guess that you're familiar with this um, graphic notation in which you have tensor that is now represented here by a square, which has a physical index and some auxiliary indices. And the many body state is a state of the physical indices. So each of the indices corresponds to one, uh, to, to the spins that are on the lattices. And the state is obtained just by contracting all these tensors in the appropriate way, according to the geometry. And so what I want to know is if you give me one of these tensors so that you have a tensor network state, a many body state, then how can I prepare it with a quantum computer? And I would like to do it efficiently. And I will later on uh, specify more concretely what I mean by efficiently. But basically what I would like to have is a minimum resources, so namely uh, lowest possible time or without few qubits or with, uh, so maybe if I do measurements with few measurements or if I do it Prepared probabilistically, so with very few repetitions. So everything should scale, let's say, with maybe with the size of the system as 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 uh, mild as possible. And so I want to talk about that. And so why do we care about preparing tensor network states with quantum computers? Well, there are several reasons that come to my mind. So one of them is that um, maybe one wants to learn about tensor networks. And so we know that some tensor networks are. If you want to compute expectation values with tensor network state, sometimes it's very efficient with classical computers, sometimes it's very difficult even with classical computers. So you could prepare them with a quantum computer, then you could 
measure these expectation values in a more efficient way, so maybe even exponentially faster than with a, than with a classical computer. So this is, would be to learn about tensor network states. The second one is that they have several quantum algorithms that require that the initial states have certain properties like low energy or low variance in energy and so on. And so these tensor networks uh, provide you exactly with uh, some states that have those conditions. And therefore these tensor networks have been proposed for several quantum algorithms of the initial state from which you start then a quantum algorithm. And the third motivation is coming more from the quantum information theory. Some of these tensor networks play, states play an important role in quantum information. So for example, and tensor network state is, is the cluster state, and the cluster state is used for a measurement based quantum computation. Another tensor network state is called GHC state, which is used for uh, metrology, or the W state, which is also used for metrology. And so, then to prepare them in quantum computer may be useful because when you can use the state then to measure something with a better precision that you could measure it without, uh, without those states. Okay, so. Now that's the outlet of my talk, I'll talk about different methods that we have been working on, on uh, preparing this uh, tensor network state with quantum computers. We started very long ago, so in 2005, where we proposed a method to prepare matrix product state. It's the one dimensional version of tensor network state with sequential generation. And in the last year, so we have also worked on some other extensions to higher dimensions. So I will mention that very briefly. Then I'll talk about a method that it turns out that is more efficient than sequential generation. It's not so general, but it can get less resources with this adiabatic generation. So it's, it is to use the adiabatic quantum algorithm to generate these tensor network states. And so it will tell you some scaling, so how, how you can gain. And then I'll, I'll, I'll show here actually that there is a way even of doing uh, optimally so that you can prove that there is no way that you can do it in a shorter time or with less resources. And then at the end, I will talk about quantum computers that in which we uh, add some possibility. So we endow them, endow them with the possibility of doing measurements and uh, classical communication. So you can have a quantum computer with a quantum circuit, and then you maybe measure some of the qubits, and depending on the outcomes of the qubits, then you act on the rest, and then you continue doing some quantum computation with the rest. Maybe you measure some of the qubits, and then you continue. And as we can, as we will show, then you can prepare even much more efficiently than with the previous methods. So the fact that you have measurements allows you to gain even exponential in resources with respect to the previous methods. And I want to give you some examples. And I will also mention that this exponential gain or these gains can also be done not only in the preparation of states, but also for certain circuits. So there are certain quantum circuits or certain unitary operations that you want to implement with a quantum circuit without measurements, then it would take much longer than if you're able to do measurements. So measurements is a nice, is a nice resource that you can add to quantum computation. And I will show you some examples here in the context of state preparation. Okay, so let me start first with some definitions for tensor networks because I will use them uh, throughout my talk. So that's the, uh, so I mean, I'll talk typically about PEPs, so project entangled pair states, which are tensor networks on lattices. And in one dimension, they are called matrix product states. Typically, my drawings will be one dimensions, but many of the things will apply to higher dimensions, and I will specify when it applies to one dimension or to higher dimensional systems. And so this is a matrix product state, but if the, any tensor networks can be described in the same way. So you have a many body state psi, which is a linear superposition of configuration states. So this would be the all possible states of your qubit, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And the coefficients, you know, the exponential number of coefficients, can be computed just by contracting these tensors. In the case of matrix product states, these tensors are uh, rank three tensors. So they have a physical index and other two that are not drawn here. And so the coefficient is obtained just by contracting these uh, auxiliary uh, indices. And this is like multiplying matrices and they take to the trace. And if you put here zero, 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 and you contract, then you will get one complex number, you got zero, 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 one. And in this way, you define tensor network states because you have all those coefficients in terms of these tensors. So in other words, if I give you one of these tensors, I am specifying the whole many body state because I just have to put this tensor many times, contract it, and with that, I define all the possible coefficients in this so-called computational basis. Okay, now there are different kinds of uh, tensor networks, so they can be classified. And one important classification is that some of them that are called injective and injective tensors are tensors in which you can find and uh, they, they can be inverted. So there exists one other tensor 
in such a way that if you contract this physical index, then you get the identity. So in other words, it's injective because it's right in right invertible. So it's an injective map from the uh, let's say auxiliary indices to the physical index. And uh, I mean, that's a, a very special property. And most of the tensor networks, you take a random tensor network, you do not fulfill that. But what will happen in general is that if you block tensors, then you will get they will get injected. So now you would consider now making out of two tensors a single tensor, just with two physical indices. Then this tensor, now that it has like two physical indices, then will probably be injected. And if it's not with two, with three. And if not with three, what with four? And with a final number of, let's say, blocking of qubits or spins, then the tensors become injected. And if this is the case, then you say that the tensors are normal. And these normal tensor networks have very specific properties. And one property is that one can prove that if you have a tensor network in such a way that by blocking it will become injective, so that the tensor is normal, then we know that there is a padding Hamiltonian for which this is the ground state and the padding Hamiltonian is local. So given a state, then you can construct a Hamiltonian which has uh, some finite range interactions. And this Hamiltonian has a unique ground state, this many body state. And on the other hand, so it has a unique ground state. And for any finite system, then it has a gap on top. This is Hamiltonian. And this is why when people work with tensor networks, you don't care about Hamiltonian. So I mean, people working on many body physics or in condensed matter physics, for example, they work with Hamiltonians. So people working in tensor networks, then they work with states. But if you want to talk about Hamiltonian, they can always build what is the parent Hamiltonian. And we know what the properties are and so on. So talking about the tensors is almost equivalent to talking about Hamiltonians. Now, there are some states or some tensor networks for which this never happens. So you can block as much as you want, and you they will never become invertible. And these are called non-normal tensor networks. And in this case, if you have a Hamiltonian for which there is the ground state, this tensor network is the ground state, then this Hamiltonian will be degenerate for sure. So it cannot be a unique ground state. So just let me give you some examples of normal uh, tensor network states. So for example, product states are normal. HLT states in one, two dimension, any dimensions are normal. And not normal tensor networks are GHC state, W state, Tori codes, any string network states, so the topological states, they are non-injective, so, sorry, non-normal. Okay, so this will be important later on because this preparation will be different for normal and non-normal. So it turns out that not normal are more difficult to prepare than normal states as we will see. And you can understand because they have some topological properties, they have some property that you will require to have some, I mean, very deep circuits in order to create them because you have to create correlations or long distance, you have to create long range entanglement. Okay, now the second concept that I'm going to use and I want to introduce, even though I'm sure that you know it very well, is about quantum circuits. So you have a quantum computer, then you can typically write it in terms of a quantum circuit and you read this from left to right. So time is running from left to right. You start with a state, which typically is a state all zeros, a product state. And then you have two qubit gates acting in, in nearest neighbors in one dimension, two dimension or three dimension. And so then you can divide them in, in layers and, and, and uh, so it's layers is such that each of the qubits interacts with the nearest neighbors in one of these layers only once. And this defines a layer. And now you count in a quantum circuit how many layers you have. This is what it's called the circuit depth. And so I will talk about the circuit depth and this will be one of the resources that I want to minimize. And talking about the circuit depth is like talking about computational time. So what I'm saying that it has a circuit depth of something is what I mean well, it's very short, it means that the computational time, the quantum computational time will be very short. But this will be one of the most important resources that I want to save. I would like to have, we, we know, for example, that any many body state can be created in the depth exponential in the size of the system. So here the goal would be to do something that is better than exponential on the size of the system, that is polynomial or even logarithmic. It would be very efficient if it's logarithmic. So that would be the goal. Okay, so this, with these definitions, then you are ready to start just telling you about the different ways of state preparation of tensor network states. So um, this is the first paper that we wrote in 2005, which is very simple. So we realized now I'm talking about matrix product states. So these are tensor networks in one dimension. This is restricted to one dimension. Then one can, in this paper, we showed that all of them can be written as some starting with qubits in state zero and then having unitary transformations that are sequentially applied. So there is a unitary transformation maybe acting on three qubits, that there is another one acting on three qubits, then another one, and the size 
of this unitary is equal to the logarithmic of this bond dimension. The bond dimension is the, the rank of this, uh, so the, sorry, the, the, the dimension of the index, that is auxiliary index here. So now what we know very well is that if we have now a three qubit or, uh, unitary or four qubit unitary, it can be decomposed in terms of a quantum circuit very easily. And the number of gates that you will need will be exponential on the size of the unitary. So here is logarithmic, so exponential logarithmic is proportional to D. And so you put this together, then you get that in order to prepare a matrix product state, whatever matrix product state in this paper, it was shown that it can be done in a circuit depth with scales proportional to the N, the number of qubits, so the, the system size, and D, which is this bond dimension. Okay, so now the goal would be to beat something like that. But before doing that, then we can extend it a couple of years ago to these to two dimensions. So that's now a sequential generation in which instead of applying now gates sequentially, the first to the first and second qubit, second, third, and so on, what you do is in two dimensions, then you follow some, some particular path. So you apply now a plaquette of gates, and then you start displacing this plaquette. So you maybe apply it first to the beginning, then here, then here, then four, then five, then six, then seven. And then by doing that, this is also sequential generation, then you will create certain tensor network states. And so what we show in that paper is that actually the subclass of tensor network states called ISO TNS states or sequentially generated states, which were introduced before, then can be prepared in this particular way. And the time is proportional to the system size because the number of plaquettes is proportional of how many qubits you have altogether. It's scaled exponentially with the, with the area of this plaquette, but anyways, proportional to n. And what is interesting is that ISO TNNs contains, for example, all string net states. So it means that all topological states in two dimensions can be generated now with a, in, the, in this particular way, in a, in a relatively simple way. But still, the circuit depth is not exponential in n, it's linear in n. So the goal now would be to improve that, so to have now preparation of states, which it's better than linear. And so this is why I'm going to adiabatic preparation. And so the adiabatic preparation is very simple. So you start with a product state and now, which is a tensor network state. And then you start, uh, you look at the parent Hamiltonian that I told you before that it always exists if you have a normal state. And now you start deforming the parent Hamiltonian in such a way that now the tensor network state is always the, or, or the tensor, the, 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 you always have a tensor network state and the Hamiltonian that you have deformed is its parent Hamiltonian. So if you don't close the gap, then you will prepare the tensor network state as long as you can find that path right, that goes from a trivial Hamiltonian, so, so from the Hamiltonian of the initial state, which is a product state, to the parent Hamiltonian of the desired state without closing the gap. And so what we show in that case is that actually you can extend even to some mm, not only normal state, but even some non-normal PEPs. But as long as you can have a gap during this process, then we show in a particular way, which the basic idea is not to adiabatically change all the Hamiltonian at once, but to change first uh, uh, some place, some parts of your Hamiltonian which are separated by the correlation length, then some other part and some other part and some other parts. And if you do it like that, then you can prove that the circle depth is polynomial in log n, not in n. Okay, so that's an improvement. There's an exponential improvement with respect to the previous methods. So the adiabatic algorithm gives you an exponential improvement in the creation of these states. And this applies to matrix product state, for example, in one dimension, but also to two dimensional methods that we that I mentioned before. Now, uh, let, me, let me concentrate now on matrix product states. And so for matrix product state, again, again, now I go to one dimension. And so summarizing what I told you before, we have the sequential generation. Then we know that this proportional to the system size. So here I'm going to write the bond dimension. And in this way, we can prepare both normal and not normal states you know, with a circuit that it is proportional to n. And from here, right away, you can easily prove that this is optimal for non-normal states. So there was a paper written many years ago in which they show 
that whenever you have something like topological order or something like GHC state long range correlations, then you need at least a circuit depth that is of the order of n. And that's very clear because in this uh, non-normal state, you have long range correlations. So you have to correlate the first particle with the last one. And so every time that you have a layer, then you can correlate one particle, uh, the next particle, the next particle. So you have, have to have a layer uh, uh, depth of your circuit, which is at least proportional to the system side to get any correlation between the two. So that's already optimal. And the adiabatic algorithm, I told you that this poly log n, is, is this optimal? Can you do something that is maybe log n or even independent of the system size? And so that's what we proved in a recent, in a recent paper. We show uh, a way in which we can create the state with a circuit depth, which is log n. It's not poly log n, so it's not log n squared, but it's log n. And the basic idea is to use this renormalization uh, group idea or renormalization procedure for matrix product state, which we, I mean, we developed many years ago. And the idea is that you have any matrix product state as you start blocking uh, this, this, as I mentioned before. And if you block as many as the correlation length, then you can approximate your state as a very simple state. It's a state which is created by having some entangled states, bipartite entangled states. This is what is represented here. So maybe these are maximally entangled state, and then having an isometry on top of it. And then what we did in this paper, and we show that this isometry can be created with a circuit depth, which is log n. And so now if you count what is the circuit depth, since these things can be done in parallel, it will be uh, log n. So this is why you have a circuit depth, which is log n. And now what we also showed is that you cannot do better than that. So we prove that, it's, uh, that there is a, lo a lower bound, which is also log n on the circuit depth to prepare a matrix product state, a generic matrix product state that is normal. Those are normal matrix product states, all of them. Sorry, I didn't write it here. I wrote it on top. And, and the basic idea is that if you, I mean, all these matrix product states have exponentially decay correlations. And if you want to cope for these exponentially uh, uh, decay correlations, then there is no other way that having a log n depth circuit. And I mean, the, the proof is relatively complex, but I mean, you can mathematically prove that. So we have now the optimal method to prepare these matrix product states. Now, now, the question is, we could do even better. So you can prepare matrix product states even faster than log n. So remember that from sequential, which is proportional to n, we go, went to log n now with an optimal. But now we are adding some other possibility to, to the quantum computer. We are allowing measurements and also that we act depending on the outcome of the measurements. So that's the scenario that we consider now. So we have our qubits again. So these are these qubits here. And we are allowed to have also auxiliary qubits. These are red qubits. And these are the ones that will get entangled and will be measured. And so the, what we do is that we have a quantum circuit now, like before, maybe with several layers, maybe with one layer or two layers. And this quantum circuit is acting on the qubits and on the auxiliary systems, like here. And it has certain depths. And then what we are allowed to do is to measure the auxiliary systems. And therefore, we will project them out. And now we measure in the sigma c basis, for example, and then you will obtain 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. And now, depending on the outcomes, then we allow to have now a unitary operator, a local unitary operator acting on the qubit. Okay, so that's mathematically what is written here. So we start with whatever initial state of our system, whatever initial state of our auxiliary system, which will be typically all zeros. Now we have a quantum circuit that is act on both of them. Now we measure in some computational basis, we get some outcome. And now depending on the outcome, we apply some unitary transformation that depend on K on all possible outcomes to the system. And of course, the first thing that you notice is that this is not deterministic. So depending on the outcome, then we'll do different things. So probably we'll have to repeat this until we are successful and we prepare the state that we want to decide. So now there are different, there are more than one theories of merit or cost functions. So first is like before the circuit depth that we would like to minimize. Also the number of ancillas for per site. So here I've brought one, but maybe we need many and maybe we need an exponential number of ancillas. So this would be bad. So we have to also take this into account and also the number of repetitions. So if we can have an exponential number of repetitions, then you can create any state. You can also prove that. So we'd like to have a small number of repetitions. And uh, so it turns out that it is possible 
to prepare some states doing measurements even deterministically. So that independent of the outcome of the measurement, then you will prepare the right state. So the repetition time of this R that they defined before, repetition is equal to one. And so in fact, it's easy to show, I will not show it here because I don't have time, that one can even implement a unitary transformation, which is this one here, is if the first qubit is in zero, I apply the identity to all the rest of the qubits. And if the state is equal, the first qubit is equal to one, then I apply sigma x to the rest of the qubits. So what I'm saying is that the process of uh, applying these unitaries, measuring the ancillas, and depending on the outcome, applying unitaries all together gives rise to a unitary operator to the system. Here, the ancillas don't, don't appear. And this unitary operator is highly non-local. And this can be done with a circuit depth equal to one, like this represented here, with a one, ancilla, one ancillary system per side and repetition equal to one because deterministic. So this happens, you're sure that whatever the outcome is, then you will apply this non-unitary operation. And this, uh, you can see that this unitary operator, you cannot create it with a normal circuit uh, or, or with a depth one circuit. So you would not have measurements. It would take much longer to do that. It would take a circuit depth that is at, at least N. And the reason is because with this unitary, you can generate the GHC state. It's very easy that you start with the first qubit in zero plus one and the rest qubits in zero and you apply this unitary operation, then you will get a GHC state. But I told you that in order to generate the GHC state, you require a locked length circuit if you don't have measurements. So what this shows is that by endowing your quantum computer with measurements and uh, actions, feedback, let's say, after the measurements, that is unitary, then you can have deterministic unitary transformations that are much more efficient because require very little resources as compared as if you wouldn't have measurements. If you wouldn't have measurements, it will have a circuit depth n, and here is a circuit depth one, and you just have to add one ancilla and measurements. And actually, one can extend it to many other unitaries, and that's what we showed in the paper that I mentioned before. And in particular, you can do the same thing with unitaries that generate Tori codes, that generate string states, that generate topological states. So this means that all topological states, all string states that are, I mean, the, the, like the Tori code, I mean, the specific ones, these are the ones that have zero correlation length, can be generated now with a depth one circuit if you are allowed to have measurements. Before, as mentioned, that you require a depth n circuit. And uh, so in particular, the kind of gates that you can do that, I mean, we classify them in that paper. And so these are, Clifford gates that have certain older properties. So these are uh, unitary operators that map Pauli operators into Pauli operators and have some extra conditions as well. And right. And now we can use that to prepare matrix product states. And what we showed in this uh, paper that I mentioned before is that actually, if you can now use measurements, then you can have a circuit depth to prepare any arbitrary matrix product state in log log n depth. And the idea is the same thing as before, just take the renormalization group fixed point and to show that now this isometry with measurements can be generated in a log log n depth circuit. And so this is what you can do. And so you can see that in the preparation, so we went from the preparation now sequential with a, a depth is n to adiabatic log n and with measurements is log log n. So there is an exponential gain in each of these uh, steps. And for not normal, then you can also see that the, the the circuit depth is also log log n and with the, the number of auxiliary system in this case like log by log t. Anyway, so maybe as an aside, so we use this um, measurement. So now, as you probably know, the people have look at how can you uh, classify phases of matters in, in terms of uh, quantum circuits. So you can say that two states are in the same phase. If you can connect it uh, with a quantum circuit that uh, the depth of the circuit scales smaller than n in the, lim in the thermodynamic limit. So now you could, and this gives uh, the classification of phases and you got classification, now you can put symmetries, this SPT phases and so on. It's a very fashionable now at the moment, to all that. So, but now you could redefine classification of phases, but in the, uh, uh, in the presence of measurements. So now you allow not only to, uh, for equivalence relation between two states, not circuits of certain depth, but circuits and measurements. And if you do that, you have a new classification of phases, which is coarser than the previous ones. And for example, the Tori code is trivial. So it's in the trivial phase 
and uh, and all in one dimension in all the state uh, there is just a single phase for for uh, the local Hamiltonians. Okay, so now I'll finish talking about a different set of uh, states. These are W states. These are states of the form, like uh, I mean, they appear in, in, in many systems. So this is a state which have one excitation is in the symmetric subspace. And there is one excitation, for example, in this linear superposition of having this excitation in any of the qubits or thick states in which you have, is also a permutation of invariant state. It's a symmetric state in which there are N excita M excitations. And so one can show that, uh, I mean, these uh, matrix product state, this, this, if you write them as matrix product states, then they have, a, they can be written as a one dimension that scales like only like the number of excitation plus one. So for example, W state can, has one dimension equal to two, and this one has one dimension equal to N plus one. They can be prepared, of course, with sequential preparation with o, o, o N. However, they cannot prepare uh, efficiently with the methods that I told you before. So they escape the methods that I told you before. I don't have time to explain the, the research for that. But anyway, so you need to devise a new way of preparing that. There have been many papers on how to prepare them with quantum computers, even with measurements. But in all these papers, the resources escape with the size of the system. So this means that if you grow your system, then it takes longer or it takes more resources, it takes more ancillas or it takes more something. And so what I want to show is what we recently showed, and we posted the paper we did two years ago, is that you can do it with resources that are independent of the system size. And the basic idea is like before, I mentioned that by using auxiliary system and making measurements, then you could do some Clifford operators that are very non-local. Then it turns out that you can also do with a different procedure, but this also requires, I mean, measurements and it's deterministic, you can also perform uh, non-Clifford operators. So for example, I mean, you have to believe me, but there is a possibility of just doing that, just by local operations, the classical communication is similar to the same before, depending on one qubit, then you apply a unitary operator to the rest of the qubits, and this one that requires a, another unitary operator. And it's not, it's not Clifford because this unitary operator can be anything, it doesn't have to be sigma x or something like that. And so this is not before, and it turns out that this, I mean, can be implemented with depth one, one and sila, and a repetition, so deterministically. And so now uh, it turns out that with this unitary, what you can do is that you can measure in a state with a quantum computer, just using this unitary, the number of excitations that you have in the system, and that's very simple. So this, the number of excitation is the total number of one, is this operator, is it's observable, which is the number of ones, the number of excitations that you have on your system. And the basic idea is that, you see, uh, if you have some initial state, so what you can do is to take an auxiliary system and put it in the state plus, in the superposition of zero plus one, and then apply this operation. So this means that in practice, you will have an extra auxiliary system. Then you will have auxiliary system and measurements in order to implement this unitary operator on your system that I'm not drawing here. And what it will do is that they will apply this operator. So this plus is zero plus one. So you have zero, nothing will happen because here you see this identity. And if you have one, then you will add a minus sign to the power of the number of excitations that you have. So this means that at the end, the state that you can have will have here a plus or minus depending on the parity of your excitations. And so if you measure now the auxiliary system, this auxiliary system, this one that is here, then you will find out whether you have, what is your parity? What is the parity of your excitations? Now that you measure that, and then you know what is the parity, well, you can do the same thing, but now you can measure the number of excitations modulo four. So what you have to do here is you to apply the identity, but here you, you take the square root of sigma c, so e to the i pi four sigma c. And so this, what we'll do is that we'll put here a plus or a minus, depending if you have excitation, what is the number of excitations modulo four? And then you can continue doing that and find with, after X applications of the same procedure, you can find, you can learn the number of excitation of modules two to the power X. And now with this tool at hand, then it's very simple to prepare the states. So the idea is that you take a product state, which is a combination of zero plus one to the power N of all your qubits. And you can write this state always as a linear superposition of these decay states because this state is symmetric, so it can be written in a symmetric basis and the coefficient will be just the binomial numbers. And now what you would do here is that you measure the number of excitations. And since you know that this 
depending on this value p that you have here, then this will be a Gaussian distribution, will be a binomial distribution, which will be centered around some number with some width. Then you have to make sure that you have, you have to measure now the number of excitations within a width, let's say between m minus x square root of m and m plus x square root of m, which is the width of the binomial distribution. Then in this state, you measure the number of excitation, you will get one of these numbers, and maybe it's the wrong one. So you repeat, and maybe it's the wrong one, you repeat. So, but at the end, you will find the right number of excitations, and if you have the right number of excitations, you will have prepared the decay state with the desired number of excitations. And so you can go through what is the number of repetitions, and so the number of repetitions of the probability, since this interval is basically one divided by square root of m, so you'll have to do a square root of m number of repetitions. And this, uh, of course, since here there are some tails, there will be some error. So there will be some, uh, uh, say, some error. And so, I mean, this case also like the logarithm of one of the error. Now the number of auxiliary systems, then, I mean, you will have to do that. And so you'll have to do several existing systems. It's case like log m. And the depth of the circuit is equal to one. So this means that indeed these dolly states, or thicker states, can be now generated in with resources, number of repetitions, number of auxiliaries, and depth of the circuit, which is independent of the size of the system. It only depends on the uh, number of excitations of your state. For example, if you have a dolly state, the number of excitations is equal to one, so it's case like one basically. So. With that, I would like to finish. I think that my time is up. So we have introduced different ways of preparing tensor network states, matrix flow like state or PEPs in higher dimensions, sequential adiabatic ones based on the fixed points of renormalization group and the ones with local operations are classical communications. We have several results for matrix product states. I give you some, some ways of improving up to log log n. And also I showed that you can create thick states you now with resources that are independent of the system size. And what I didn't mention here is that apart from preparation of states, then I told you that you can implement some gates as well, so or some unitary operators just doing measurements. And now you can use these unitary operators to generate some or some quantum circuits more efficiently than without measurements. And so I guess that one of the take home messages that I want to send is that apart from preparation of tensor network states efficiently with these methods, then applying measurements and uh, uh, classical communication, they can speed up some of the quantum circuits and speed up the quantum computation. And with that, I would like to mention the people who were involved in this project. So for the last uh, paper that I mentioned on the double states, it was Lorenzo Pirolli and Giorgio Stiliaris for adiabatic quantum computation, nine mass in uh, Sichuan way. And for some work that I didn't mention here, so this went through very fast, is my current manuals, Stekuts and Fabri Bakari. And with that, I'd like to thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for inspiring a very clear talk. Now we have time for questions and discussion. Also, for the online participants, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Martin. Ignacio, thanks very much. I'd, I'd, li I'd like to ask you do, do you see impediments in extending to 3D? Um, no, 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 I don't think so. I mean, the, the sequential uh, generation, for example, can be extended to CD, but it will give you a subclass of tensor network states in 3D, so maybe they are not so interesting. The adiabatic generation would be, I mean, can be extended to, to 3D. So as long as the conditions are fulfilled, namely that you have always what we call this normal tensor network, so that there is a there are unique ground states of Hamiltonians and there is a gap on top, then you can use this adiabatic uh, method. And uh, if uh, uh, and the and the and the computational time will scale like log n. So in fact, in the in the paper that we wrote for for the adiabatic computation, the, sorry, poly log n, then we were not restricted to two dimensions. So we did it for for higher dimensions. Now, for some of the other things that I that I was mentioning, like the measurements, local operations, and classical communication. So here I was concentrated and. At matrix product states basically in, in this W state, so it's one dimension. So, and but we also mentioned Tori code. So I guess that some of the things one has to see to which to which states can be can be extended. But I would I would I would believe that that I mean a wide class of states that would take a, 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 a long a big depth with a quantum computer 
now can be done in depth one with measurements. Thanks. Maybe, uh, so really exciting to see what measurements can do. Uh, what is the effect of imperfections in measurements and how do we mitigate against any uh, errors or problems that can come with imperfect measurement? Okay, so here, now that's, a, that's an interesting question that we are looking at the moment is that now, uh, of course, you would like not to, I mean, another resource would be the resilience to errors. And so imagine that you have now to make things simpler, that in each gate, you have certain error with certain probabilities. So you apply some Pauli operator and also in each measurement, you have the same error, right? I mean, that may happen in some implementations. Some of them, they're different. You will have to have different, but then the, uh, the, 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 what you would like to do is to save in the total number of applications of gates or measurements that you do. And in our methods, we save also on that. So this means that if the errors in the measurement are the same as the errors in the gates that you perform, then you will do better than if you would do just without measurements. Now, if the measurement errors are much bigger, then of course it would be, this would be much worse. But if, but if they are small, then it would be even better. So this would depend, but I would say that if they are of the same order of magnitude that you will gain because the number of operations altogether is smaller than what you have to plan. Thank you. Yeah, I saw a question from Thomas. Thomas. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for a nice talk. I, I sort of didn't follow this, this work so far. Very interesting. Um, so you didn't comment a lot on the accuracy that you want to achieve. So do these different approaches behave differently depending on what quality of preparation you want to have? Okay, so that's something that I didn't have to, to go through. So I gave so the, the uh, sequential preparation. Um, this is exact. Okay, so this, let's say, as long as you can put many digits in your gates and so on, so this would be exact. The adiabatic generation is not exact, and so you have an error, and so you have uh, uh, um, a dependence on your error. So it, it depends on the time and then the error that you want to achieve. And so it goes, I mean, the, like in, in, in many of these adiabatic methods, if you do it well, it goes like the logarithm of one divided by the error, log of one over epsilon. With, because we know that you do things adiabatically and you do it with, I mean, greedy functions and so on, that they have infinite zero derivatives at the beginning and at the end that you can get this logarithm. So this, this happens here as well. Now, in the, in the uh, one with um, uh, local operations and classical communication that they mentioned to create matrix product state, that is exact. And the optimal is also exact, so there is no error. And for W states, actually, it scales like log log one over epsilon, for example, for the W state. It goes like doubly logarithmic with the, with the error. But what is what was important to, to uh, I think that is really relevant is that so previous methods to prepare W states and decay states, all of them consider exact uh, exact methods. So they wanted to prepare it exactly, and this is why the resources scale like the size of the system in all the methods. Now we get around that because we say well we can have an error at the end. And it turns out that having an error in is not that bad because it's case like log log one over epsilon and some of the resources for, for some of these case like log one over epsilon, but log one over epsilon means that you can get many digits of precision at no cost that we nevertheless will have because there will be errors or whatever in your quantum computer. So, I mean, it's an important issue. What is the scaling with the error? But here, I mean, we take it to our advantage at allowing to have a little error then allows us to gain a lot. So, so even in these exact approaches, like if you would allow for a little error, you expect like a huge gain, so <laughs> mm. uh, and no, I don't. I would not. I don't think that that there would be a huge gain. No, no, no. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any more question? Okay, I, I I'll ask one, and you guys ask questions. So now, still, uh, I. I heard the tensor network states, you know, encode the every law of entanglement in the states. I'm just wondering the improvement, uh, you know, given by the measurements. Does that have anything to do with the every law entanglement of, of the tensor network states? Like, so, is it what, you think? no. In 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 fact, so what we showed already in one of these papers that I mentioned here. Is that with the measurement you cannot get around the 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 area law. 
So if you do measurements and classical communication, so you do a measurement depending on the outcome of the measurement, then you do unitaries or you do gates and you do something like that, actually very simple to prove. It's nothing very difficult, but you can show that, uh, I mean, you have a finite depth circuit, you will always have the area law. There's no, I mean, the measurements will not get around this area law. But still, this is why I mean, we don't we don't violate anything by saying that we can prepare with that one uh, Tory code states because Tory codes have area law. And so measurements, I mean, don't do anything like that. But we will not be able to create our states that are scrambled or something like that, that have a lot of entanglement. These, the measurements may help you, but you will have a depth and circuit for sure. You will require depth and circuit. Gotcha, thank you. Any other question? Eric, can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah, Thomas, please. Yeah, so, uh, so that you can if you can prepare also PEP sufficiently, then the, the way sort of to using this in VQE service is not very far, right? So um, do you see any any obstacles sort of uh, bigger challenge than to use this in VQE in this scheme? You mean to use these tensor networks as a VQE? Yeah. No, no, no. I think that this would be this would be. Uh, I mean. I mean, one question that that happens with VQE is that it requires sampling, many, right? many, many sampling, and and so to do optimization, it's, it gets very hard. And so, I mean, you will not get around that. So, still, the gay. I mean, you can prepare these tensor networks to change a couple of. So probably, I mean, what would make sense is that you have uh, you create a tensor network state, maybe a PEPS. Then you use a classical computer to put computer expectation values. You optimize the parameter. Then you create it. And once you have created, then you put a couple of gates <laughs> layers on top, and then you optimize with respect to layers to decrease uh, uh, further the, the cost function, to increase the cost function. So to get as much as you can with classical computation, and then you put it at the, at the end as something that probably you cannot do classically. You need to, I mean, uh, to put it on top, and this will probably help. Yeah, yeah maybe, the, maybe there's one area. Yeah. Yeah, if you could optimize an overlap, right, that would be great. I mean, you say, okay, just just add more more sort of uh, gates on top to to improve the state. But if you really wanted to do an optimization, yeah, you can do gradient descent because you could uh, well, 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 well. you can do. No, no, but if you have to truncate, right? no, you don't want to truncations. No, no, yeah, you can do you can do like quasi mutant methods or something. Yeah. I mean, the problem the problem there is, and you know this very well, is that this would be also a greedy method. So you fix now the tensor network and then put some parameters. But in principle, you would like to start changing your unitaries, let's say your gates, but also the parameters of your tensor networks because yeah. it's probably not the best thing to uh, just to fix them. And this will be hard again because this will require many many measurements. So. Yeah. Thanks. Ignacio, I have one more question. It's kind of my uh, curiosity of the technical details. So in the second part of the talk, the adiabatic preparation, uh, you mentioned without measurements, the log n is optimal. I'm just wondering how does the assumption of no measurements enter the proof of, of that log n as the optimal? Well, the, 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 and the basic idea is that at the end, you have to, to I mean, uh, you have you have a, a one of these tensor networks, and they have finite correlation length. And so one would say, well, okay, so let's prepare blocks that have a correlation length or several correlation lengths. These are product states, and uh, this this will probably work. But how big they have to be the blocks, and so it will have to be like correlation length or something like that. But it turns out that now this state will not be exact. This will not be exact because at the surface you will make errors. So they will be very good at the bulk, let's say in each of the blocks, but at the surface, they will be very bad. So the number of errors that you will have there uh, then would be basically the total number of qubits divided by the number of blocks or something or, the, or something like that. And so this is the number of errors. And then uh, uh, then what you say, well, let's, but, but in order to reduce that, then let's make the blocks bigger. But if you make the blocks bigger, then the circuit that goes up, because you will have to do in each of the blocks, you will have to have a circuit. So you see that there must be a trade-off for doing that. And then the trade-off gives you this logarithm. So you do a back of the envelope calculation, you get this logarithm. So here, 
the, I mean, just the idea that you have to have create correlations at the, uh, uh, I mean, exponentially small correlations, right? Sorry, uh, exponentially decaying correlations, but still, in order to have some error, then they have to be a little bit of correlations, and you have to get this correlation right. And this mm -hmm. is the the part that that I mean requires the quantum circuit. And I'm saying that you put, I mean, back of the email calculus, you give you this log n. Now you have measurements, and it turns out that you can create correlations, even very long range correlations with measurements. So I, I mentioned before that you start with create like entangled states, entangled states, entangled states, like a dimer state of entangled state, and then you make local measurements here, and you will create a, a, a correlations very long just with a circuit, a circuit that that's one. Okay, and so this allows you to create this correlation. This is what it can get around this uh, this log n. That's kind of intuitive idea. Yeah, that's very intuitive. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, any final round of questions? Yeah, let me let me ask you a question just yeah. following up on that. So, um, one one of the things we did recently, which you may or may not have seen, was to develop scalable circuits for the to prepare the vacuum of the Schwinger model. And so there was an optimization that's done classically using the damp VQE, where a pool of operators this operators are scalable. Uh, so. The, the, but uh, measurements were not were not used, but it was an exponentially converging uh, sequence of operators. So I guess my question is: Do you imagine if you is there a way to bring to integrate uh, the ADAP BQE with measurements to improve that sort of perturbative approach in an exponentially converging way? Okay, so it's a it's a it's a very good question, and and I think that indeed it is the case, and uh, because. You see, imagine that you give me the, the Hamiltonian that that's the parent Hamiltonian for matrix product state, and I don't know it. And then I try to prepare it with BQE. Then what I know is that to have a high fidelity, I would need a log and depth, because this is the what I what I I mean what we proved. So you will have to, to have a depth that will increase with the size of the system. Now, this is for the for having a fidelity, let's say of one minus epsilon. Then you will have to have that. But and so you do a VQE, then you cannot do better because it's a, it's a circuit, and so you will have to have this this kind of scaling. But imagine that in the VQE, you just put a layer of uh, just one layer, not a, a lock and layer, and then you put measurements and do you variation with respect to what are the measurements that you get, and and do you allow to do unitaries? So then I promise you that you, I mean, you do the optimization and it works. So the, you you can find you will find one which will have depth one circuit. For, okay. for this particular Hamiltonian. So what I'm saying that there exist examples where you can provably, I mean, you can prove that these measurements, if you do this variational and the minimization works, so you don't get stuck and things like that, then you will find better solutions. Okay, really interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, final chance to ask questions to Ignacio. <laughs> I see no more questions. Let's thank Ignacio again. Thank you. Uh, recording.